to another episode of No Trash, Just Truth. No Trash, Just Truth is a podcast of Proverbs 910 Ministries. We're your hosts, Rose Spiller and Chris Paxson. Welcome back. Chris, my granddaughter, Lily, recently had me take a personality test. And I'll spare you all the results, but I will say that they were pretty dead on. I mean, there was one thing that was a little disconcerting. They said that my personality type was what they use to model villains in movies after. <laughs> no, no. I I was a little taken aback by that, but whatever. I would have been too. <laughs> but other than that, it was it was pretty accurate. One thing that it said, which is definitely true of me, is that I love to know things. Learning one fact about something sets me off on a quest to find out as much as I can about the subject. And that's very true of me. It's why I love taking classes like we do constantly. I love reading all kinds of biographies and studying history. And I'm never just satisfied with one book, say on George Washington or D-Day or some other subject. I like to read multiple sources and get multiple perspectives and information and put it all together. And that would explain why you are loving this series on the Minor Prophets. When you read and study all 12 of the Minor Prophet books together, you see that they're going to say a lot of the same things, but each of them has their own unique slant on things. And we try to present that unique slant in each episode, but when it sounds like we're repeating ourselves in some of these episodes, keep in mind that that's exactly what these books are doing. And it's a good thing. We need it. Yeah, it is a good thing for a few reasons. By reading them over and over, it really drives God's messages home. It shows us the congruity of God and his word. And that is very important. And we've said this before, you know, it's not like he gave Joel one message and then Zechariah and Malachi something else. He used these 12 different men, the minor prophets, at different times in history to preach to either Israel and or Judah. And they were addressing the people where they were at at that time. But God doesn't change. The things he accused and reprimanded Judah about in Joel are the same things that he accuses them and reprimands them about in Malachi. And that should be a huge comfort to us. Last night at Bible study, one of these ladies used the term thick skulled, and I have not heard that for a while, but we are thick skulled. It takes a lot to get to, you know, get stuff in our brain. For sure. But you're right. You're right, Rose. We serve a consistent, immutable God. One thing about the fake pagan gods was that the people never knew what to expect of them. Can you imagine? No. They would talk about the gods being cranky or hungry or finicky. If their crop failed, the people would jump through hoops to figure out what ticked the gods off. We saw in Jonah that when a storm came, the sailors were drawing lots to see who had angered one of those gods, little G gods. And it's no different today. Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, they all have no assurance of what is expected of them or their little G gods. They just struggle through life and they hope that they're making their gods happy enough and doing what's expected of them. Yeah. And it's no different with false Christianity. I mean, take the word of faith movement, for example, you have to hope you have enough faith to prompt God to act on your behalf and to benefit you. Are you praying enough, giving enough, serving enough, believing enough? Like you said, Chris, it's just an exhausting way to live. But true Christianity is completely different than all of those things. God has given us scripture that he literally breathed out. It's divine, it's perfect, and it's to be the authority in our life. We don't have to guess what pleases or displeases God. He's written it down for us. We don't have to wonder if he's going to accept us or if we're going to do enough good stuff to make him happy. He's given us a very crystal clear gospel message. Exactly. And the point of all of this is that instead of us being like, didn't God just say the same thing in another book? We should be grateful that he is so consistent. So just some things to keep in mind as we continue through the Minor Prophets. Today, we're going to look at the book of Zephaniah, and we're going to see similarities to other books. Imagine that. Zephaniah talks about the day of the Lord, just like Joel and Obadiah and Amos did. And 
We see that in Isaiah and Jeremiah and some of the New Testament writers too. So you got to think that since God inspired so many people to write about it, it must be pretty important. It certainly is important. And we're going to talk about that. But Chris, let's give an intro to Zephaniah and point out something that is completely unique about him. Zephaniah 1.1 says, the word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. So Zephaniah's ministry was during the reign of King Josiah of Judah, which would put it between 640 and 609 BC, probably more towards the beginning part around 638. But that's not what the unique thing about Zephaniah is. Notice he gets a long genealogy and notice a name in his descendancy, King Hezekiah of Judah. So that makes him a member of the royal court. He's the only prophet that has this distinction. And that makes him a relative of King Josiah too. Hezekiah began a revival of reform in Judah, but his son Manasseh was really evil and we've talked about him. In fact, scripture says Manasseh's sin and evil was the reason that God was sending Babylon to conquer Judah. However, Manasseh's grandson, Josiah, not only reformed Judah like his great-grandfather did, meaning Hezekiah, but he took it even further. Josiah has been called the greatest king and the greatest reformer that reigned throughout the entire time in Israel and Judah that they were divided. So it's during Josiah's reign and his reforming of that nation that Zephaniah ministers to the people of Judah. His prophecies are specifically for the people of Judah. Yeah, they are. And unlike some that we've seen, Zephaniah doesn't start out with blessings. In fact, Zephaniah 1, 2 to 3 is some of the strongest curse language that we see in any of the prophetic books. Zephaniah 1, 2 to 3 says, I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away man and beast. I will sweep away the birds of the heaven and the fish of the sea and the rubble with the wicked. I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. So Chris, there's a couple things that we should note here. First, God is using hyperbole to make his point. Just like Jesus had said, before you remove the speck from your neighbor's eye, remove the plank from your own eye. It's not meant to be taken literally, obviously. It would be like us saying, oh, the Philadelphia Phillies totally destroyed the New York Mets yesterday. They didn't actually physically destroy the entire Mets baseball team. They just outplayed them and they won by a lot. The points to get the reader's attention and to understand the seriousness of what God is saying. Yeah, and hyperbole will do that. But Rose, that doesn't mean that we should ignore the language that Zephaniah uses. While you were reading that, all I kept thinking about was the flood. And I think that's the point. The Judaites would have known all about Noah and the flood and God sweeping away man and beast, birds and fish, and especially him sweeping away the wicked. The Judaites should have made the connection between Zephaniah's words and the flood and realized that things in Judah were as bad as they were when God destroyed every living thing with the flood except for Noah and his family and the animals in the ark. I mean, it should have gotten their attention. Yeah, and it should have really sobered them up. Yeah. And if they were thinking, well, God's talking about the wicked, good, destroy them all. Verse four would have put them right in their place. Verse four says, I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So God's pretty specific here. And we've seen this over and over in these minor prophetic books. God is counting Judah and Israel among the wicked. He counts them among his enemies at that point. And Chris, that should make us stop short. Yeah, we're on this side of Jesus, and we should be very grateful for that. We've been imputed with Jesus's righteousness, so we won't ever again be counted as enemies of God. However, that promise is only for those who truly belong to God. I was just reading a whole bunch of stuff on the differences between the visible church and the invisible church. And there's a lot in the visible church, those who go to church, who aren't members of the invisible church. And these are people who say they're Christians, but they're only playing at being Christian. 
yeah, we're studying that in Sunday school right now. And it's true. But Rose, that was what was going on in Judah and Israel. They considered themselves God's chosen people. And that's why they were excited about the day of the Lord, thinking that they were going to get rewarded. But they were quickly told, and we'll see Zephaniah do the same, that the day of the Lord is something to be terrified of if you don't truly belong to God. And if there's anyone that's listening or watching who calls themselves a Christian and maybe even goes to church every week, yet hasn't made Jesus the center of their life and the priority in their life, has no interest in God's word, never prays, isn't worried about putting themselves under the authority of the Bible, maybe doesn't even think much about God from Monday to Saturday. Well, this is a really, really good time to consider God's words to Judah as a warning to you and get yourself right with the Lord. Get yourself right with God. Amen to that. Zephaniah goes on in chapter one, naming specific sins that God has against Judah, idolatry, especially among the priests, the leaders of the people, syncretism, polytheism, which is worshiping many gods, completely turning away from God, not praying, not seeking the will of God, political corruption, violence, fraud, assimilating with foreigners. He tells them, be silent before the Lord because the day of the Lord is near. Zephaniah and God aren't messing around here. Mm -mm. Now, if you remember, the day of the Lord refers to Jesus's second coming and God's final judgment. Just listen to how Zephaniah describes that day for those who don't belong to God. A day of wrath is that day, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring distress on mankind so that they shall walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Revelation 14 describes this pouring out of blood as the wine press of God's wrath, where the wicked's blood will flow for 184 miles. Now think about that. Revelation 19 describes the flesh of the wicked being like dung. And there's an angel calling out to all the birds. And this is what the angel saying to the birds. Come, gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. So just as in all of the narratives that talk about the day of the Lord, it's something that should be feared and dreaded for those who are God's enemies. And for those of us that think on that day that there's going to be some second chance to accept Jesus, well, Zephaniah 1 verse 18 clears that up pretty quickly. And I'll quote it here. In the fire of his jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed. For a full and sudden end he will make of all the inhabitants of the earth. There's no second chance there. And just to clarify this, Revelation makes it clear that before we get to the very end and God's final judgment on the wicked, the church will be taken up with Jesus. Yeah, I think that's important to talk about. It's not like the rapture before all things get bad, but before the final judgments, the seventh bowl and seal and trumpet, the church will be taken up. So chapter two opens with Zephaniah warning the people to get right with God before the day of the Lord. Like you were just saying, Chris, his words sound very familiar to Micah's words. He says in Zephaniah 2, 3, seek the Lord, all you humble of the land who do his just command, seek righteousness, seek humility. And if you remember from Micah, when we talked about it, Micah's book says, do what's right, love mercy, walk humbly with God and wait. So after this, God then turns his attention from Judah to the enemies of Judah. And again, this is something we've seen over and over. God says he'll destroy Philistia, Moab, Cush, and Assyria, all nations we've heard mentioned before in other books. But then he turns his attention back to Judah in chapter three. But this time he zeroes in on the city of Jerusalem, which is where their worship was held. Zephaniah 3, one to four says, woe to you who is rebellious and defiled the oppressing city. She listens to no voice. She accepts no correction. 
She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. Her officials within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves that leave nothing till the morning. Her prophets are fickle, treacherous men. Her priests profane what is holy. They do violence to the law. Again, sobering words. Those are sobering words. And Zephaniah further indicts Jerusalem and the pagan nations. He shows them just how sinful and how shameful their behavior is in comparison with God's behavior. God is completely and perfectly just and righteous. He says that despite warnings and punishment inflicted on the people by God, the wicked were, in his words, all the more eager to make all their deeds corrupt. And again, we see the same thing in other prophetic books and in Revelation. Revelation 16, 8 to 10 says, The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch the people with fire. They were scorched by the fierce heat, and they cursed the name of God who had power over these plagues. They did not repent or give him glory. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sores. They did not repent of their deeds. Rose, the wicked are not going to repent of their, they're not going to repent no matter how bad their punishment gets. They just curse God and curse God and curse God and continue to. Yeah. And every time I read that, it just blows my mind. But if that yeah. doesn't make you clearly see that nobody would come to God if the Holy Spirit didn't regenerate their hearts, I don't know what will. I mean, I know the people saw Jesus doing miracles and they didn't believe. Exactly. God says in Zephaniah 3, 8, therefore wait for me, declares the Lord. For the day when I rise up to seize the prey, for my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out upon them my indignation, all my burning anger. For in the fire of my jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed. So two important things that we should note from this, Chris. First, for the people of God, again, we see the same directive that Micah gave them, wait you belong to God, you need to wait. And that waiting is going to be hard at times. Things are going to get really bad and maybe worse than we can ever imagine. But we're told to wait, wait for God's justice to be fulfilled. And in the meantime, we need to stay faithful and stand firm in God's truth. It just That just makes me think of the seven churches. That just makes me think of the two that are righteous and suffering. Mm. Yeah. And you, you said there were two things. Well, the other important thing in Zephaniah is to see that while God's language in chapter one about sweeping everything off the earth is hyperbole, it wasn't hyperbole for the wicked. God will sweep them completely away and destroy them in the fire. Just like the other prophetic books that we've looked at and will look at in the future here, God makes it clear he's not playing around. He's long suffering and he's patient, but one day that patience will run out. And for those who are opposed to God, that's going to be a day that's going to be more terrifying than they can ever imagine in their wildest dreams. And yeah. it's going to be eternal. It is going to be eternal, but they still won't repent. Nope. But for those of us who do belong to God, it's going to be a day more wonderful than we could ever imagine. And Chris, I know we've said this over and over, but how gracious and merciful is God that whenever he writes judgment in scripture, it's always followed up by passages of hope. That's because that's who he is. He's the almighty, holy, sovereign judge of the universe who can't let sin go unpunished. But he's also the loving, gracious, good God, father, who wants to lavish his love on his people. And we see this so clearly in Zephaniah 3, 9 to 13. And there's a beautiful promise there that I want to read. For at that time, I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, the daughter of my dispersed ones shall bring my offering. On that day, you shall not be put to shame because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. 
For then I will remove from your midst your proudly exultant ones, and you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. But I will leave in your midst a people humble and lowly. They shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord. Those who are left in Israel, they shall do no injustice and speak no lies, nor shall there be found in their mouth a deceitful tongue. For they shall graze and lie down and none shall make them afraid. I love that. What a day that will be. Oh, what a day. And for those who belong to God, the day of the Lord is something that we should long for. The Holy Spirit indwells in us to sanctify us and make us more and more like Jesus. This passage from Zephaniah shows that at the day of the Lord, we will be like him. Uh, Rose, I'm so thankful. I'm so done with my own sin. I hate my sin. Sometimes I hate other people's sin more than mine, but I really should hate my own the most. Yeah, we should hate all sin. Yeah, but we won't have any more sin and neither will anybody else that's with us. Years ago, there was a popular fad and we are probably dating ourselves here, but there were these bracelets. They were called WWJD bracelets. And what they stood for was what would Jesus do? That was to remind you as you looked at your bracelet to be like Jesus. At the day of the Lord, everyone will do what Jesus would do because we will be sinless like Jesus. And because everyone will be sinless, no one ever has to be afraid again. Think back to the garden before the fall. Adam and Eve were naked and didn't even care and they didn't even notice. They had a perfect relationship with each other and a perfect one with God. Each was doing exactly what God created them to do and it was paradise. That's what the day of the Lord is going to bring back for us. Can't wait. Mm. And that's why even after some harsh and really painful punishments that the Judaites were going to have to endure, things that we might have to endure, Zephaniah can end with telling the people to have joy because there will be restoration. The book of Zephaniah ends with verses 14 to 20. Just listen to the hope and the beautiful promises contained in these verses. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, rejoice and exalt with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day, it shall be said to Jerusalem, fear not, O Zion, let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst. A mighty one will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time, I will deal with all your oppressors and I will save the lame and gather the outcasts and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you in. At that time, I will gather you together for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. Love that too. Me too. Zephaniah looks forward to a day where God changes the speech of his people so that everyone will call and serve him with one accord. The current and the future cleansing fires of judgment that God brings on us and all of his people serves to purify us. And one day, all of our flaws will be removed forever. And guess what? God will rejoice in mercy. Something else that we may not think about, God has emotions. They are magnificent emotions, but they aren't the same emotions as we have. God's emotions are always perfectly proportioned. But someday when his people are all clean and safe, God will rejoice over them, singing over them loudly. His joy will reverberate throughout the earth. God's character and mankind's good will be served and God will be glorified. Again, what a day that's going to be. Mm. And Chris, we don't often think about it, and it's hard to think about this when we're in the midst of it, but God's judgment is mercy. 
His punishment and discipline is meant to bring his people to repentance and bring them back to him. He doesn't just leave us where we are. Punishment and discipline is all part of the sanctification process. You hear people say, you know, come as you are. God accepts you exactly as you are. Well, yes, you come in whatever state you're at, but he never leaves you there. He never just no. says, that's okay. You came with this sin. You're, you're fine to stay in that. No. As Hebrews 12, five to six says, my son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. God disciplines and chastises us, maybe even brings some really hard and devastating things into our lives. And that's not to make light of those things, but he's refining us. He's trying to make us look more and more like the one true son, Jesus, our elder brother. As Paul says in Romans 8, 28 to 29, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Our response to the books like Zephaniah should be twofold. It should bring us to our knees in gratitude that when God looks at us, he sees Jesus's perfect righteousness and not our shameful sinfulness. And therefore, instead of being terrified of the horrors that will happen on the day of the Lord, we can wait for it with expectant joy that on that day, God's going to complete the good work that he began in us. It should also make us see the urgency and the desperate need to preach the gospel. I know we say this over and over and over again, but our hearts need to break for those who don't know Jesus. We need to trust the sovereignty of God, of course, for the salvation of all of his people. But we need to be willing and enthusiastic participants in being a part of that. That's right. Because we are a part of it. People are saved by the hearing of the word. They need their heart regenerated first, but that's all part of the salvation promise. They need to hear the gospel message. Chris, I love what you shared last week about how to start a conversation about the gospel. You had said someone told you that he tells people there's only two ways to be saved. Be totally perfect your whole life. So you earn salvation or you need to be forgiven. And I've really taken that to heart. That is a great lead in to preaching the gospel message. Like we talked about in an episode of 5 a.m. Theology, we need to be boldly gentle when we're giving the gospel message. I think we all need to be intentional about starting those conversations. And that's where we're going to leave this today. Have a blessed day, everybody.